I'd like to welcome Chris C. Chris is the head of R&D at McGraw-Hill Education. He did a great presentation last year, and I think he set the bar last year. So he's going to have to do an even better one this year. He's got this unbelievable vision for rethinking education. Right, Chris? Yes. Thank you very much uh, for coming to this session, and glad to be here in San Francisco. Uh, I'm the head of R&D for the McGraw Education, which we call ourselves a $2 billion startup. As of April of this year, we are now an independent company uh, with our goal of turning ourselves from a textbook company to a digital learning company. And I think it all makes a lot of sense why there's a tremendous opportunity for the transformation of teaching and learning, and McGraw Hill Education want to be part of that. On that note, I'm going to start talking about some of the aspects that we are working on as far as the technology foundation, which will break this open and create new innovation that we can build upon to start not just delivering ebooks, which are great and they are amazing, uh, um, you know, study of user interfaces, but you know, talk about the type of interaction and data supported learning that is not yet possible today. So, let's talk about what. R&D means at McGraw Education. So we do two things in our MEG labs, as we call ourselves. We do a lot of innovation around HTML5 because at the end of the day, it's about the user. It's about the user experience. It's about what they see, what they touch, what they feel that they can interact with and make a change and affect change in themselves, your student, or to your students if you're a teacher. But to do that, we also simultaneously need to push the envelope on what is possible as far as the delivery of information, data, and content via the cloud. And the cloud is important because of global, because we want to be teaching people where they are, no matter where they're in the world, from K through 12 to higher ed to life. So I think it's slightly unusual. We're really pushing the envelope on both sides. And I see myself as a person who loves both of these things. Am I a back-end guy? Yeah, I love that. Am I a front-end guy? Yes, I love that too. But when you bring those two things together and you put enough care and, 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 and thoughtfulness to them, then you can really build really awesome stuff. Let me show you a couple of things we're working on. So we have made a tremendously large investment uh, in learning about JavaScript MVC, which is a way of describing the type of very native experiences but within the browser. So we have built this um, using Ember.js, and we actually have been working with the uh, Ember.js community, uh, which is founded by Yehuda Katz and Tom Dale of Apple and the Ruby and Rails fame, uh, respectively, um, to work on this course application. So this is an online course. Uh, but this is not just an experience a student will see. This is a building application that allows you to uh, rearrange and add new lessons, add new topics completely within the browser without reloading the page. So it's like you're forming the syllabus in your curriculum uh, if you're a teacher uh, to make the, put this together. The amazing thing about this platform is that this course builder application is the same platform that we use to create our course template. So if, you want to, you, if you're a professor coming to us and say, I would like to teach a biology course this fall, well, you can work with one of our learning uh, uh, consultants, and that person will use the same tool the professor will use. So we externalize the tool that we use internally, or internalizing the tool we use externally, either way you look at it, but everybody's on the same platform. So if you want to discover new content and bring in new resources, our entire McGraw-Hill content library is on your right. You search for it, it's contextual. Uh, last year I pre made a presentation with the Couchbase folks about integrating Elasticsearch with Couchbase, and that's what it's being used for. So we can get a full text index of all these content you can bring into it. And that's amazing, it's, it, it, and, and that's for another day. But another aspect of what we work on is work on data, data in the cloud. So if I'm collecting data about student activity and what they're doing, I can really give professors or the, the student themselves some insight about what they're doing. So we will build these kind of student dashboards for the professor, which will monitor the engagement trends. How often have you come onto your, the site? Did you actually got your quiz correct or not? And we munch all those data together and figure out what are the high-risk students that a professor should reach out to, right? And what are the factors? Why, why is this student medium risk? What are the latest or recent uh, data uh, that would give us an uh, understanding of what this student needs to do? So at the end of the day, we built this application on a traditional star schema, which is a relational approach, uh, pretty well um, you know, thought through by the, uh, Ralph Kimball and his disciples of how to build that. 
And that's all good, except for one thing. This is a little bit after the fact. So we presented last year a, a vision called AdSense, which is kind of like AdSense in the advertising. I want to know, as you do things, what the student activity means and be able to make a real-time reaction to it. So if you perform an activity, I want to capture the action in a granular basis and then push a reaction by way of some algorithm, some decision engine, and be able to bring you recommendations. Say, hey, you seem to be missing this concept. This is the piece of content that McGraw-Hill and all our partners have that you should look at. To build a system like this using a star schema Kind of a problem because I have to refresh my data. I need to reload my data. It may not be, we may not be able to react to that person that minute, that that second, and that makes the data something left to be desired on the data infrastructure underlying the traditional data warehouses. So, the code that underlie the model we have yesterday, uh, just shown was you know still I think on the Couchbase Lab GitHub. So you can take a look at what we did with Couchbase and Elasticsearch. That underlying foundation is already there. But let's move forward. We talk about NoSQL. And I, I think this is great. Hi, Couchbase says, NoSQL, we are the folks for you. But I'm going to say no to one more thing today. What is it? I'm going to say no to ETL. What's ETL? Well, let's go back. When we say SQL, let, before we say no to anything, let's see, you know, what are you saying no to? What we're saying is some sort of query language that allows you to declare and express the logic for machine to calculate and process. That's valuable. But the problem is, the reason why sometimes SQL query don't perform is complex multi-layer queries request when the user asks for it can be slow, right? Now, if you have really powerful machine and you're doing really aggressive stuff, that's okay, two minutes is a very reasonable thing to do. But one way to improve the performance that people realize is why don't we extract the data out of these queries, write them back to the database so the next time you just get the row or whatever out. And that's where ETL comes to be, which is store the results of the intermediate or final steps of these queries back in the database so that you, know, you can get access pretty fast. And a lot of NoSQL databases are being used as storage for these aggregates. Some of them will, will delegate some, some queries on that. So it's a mix of that. The problem of ETL, and that's the reason why this title is called No ETL, is store data gets out of date really, really quickly, out of sync with reality, right? And refreshing that data is sometimes expensive, right? So the question then becomes, if we go back to the diagram, when we're saying no SQL or no ETL, what we're really saying is not saying no to anything. It's saying yes to something. We want the logic in something like SQL, and today we saw the announcement of Nickel, the query language that will go on top of Couchbase, and really excited about that. It's not about no SQL, it's about I want the logic in there some way, somehow in an efficient manner. With ETL, you gotta admit that doing things in steps makes sense. Because what that allows us to do is that by doing, doing a query, you get the fresh data. By storing the steps, you get the fast access. What you really want is to combine the two things together somehow. And there have been attempts to do that. But today I'm going to propose a particular methodology or at least a technique that I think could be a little bit of a game changer. And it's FLP. It stands for Functional Reactive Programming. What is FLP? Wikipedia says something about behavior, signals, events, and switchings, and pipelines, and all that stuff like that. Too long, didn't read. So I'm going to give you a hint. I think everybody knows what FLP is, because Excel is a functional reactive programming language. So let's look at what that means. Excel is functional. Functional programming means that everything is either a value or a function that generates a value. So you have a cell that you typed in about your bid, and then there's a sum, which is a function, subtotal of that. So that's you know, functional language. But it's reactive, which means that if I change the cell here from 2300 to something else, another cell that depends on it changes in near real time. It's really fast. Now, if you're a really crazy Goldman Sachs analyst, then you just turn off that because it's really slow. But most of the time, that's the intent, and people will come to use that. And I can tell you that people who do Excel is actually programming. 
right? Because they, they have all these statistical functions and multi-sheets and linking between workbooks. Oh my God. You can start out something small and then you build on top of that, this composition, new tabs, budget, to cash flows, to accounting statement, to tax returns. These are things that build on top of existing aggregates you've made. And then when you have enough aggregates or high enough key performance entrance, KPIs, you can start graphing within Excel. Now, nobody can access it unless it's download a workbook, so it's not very good. Microsoft is pushing for this on the web, but you know, it's not, we're not quite there yet. But here's the truth. The world runs on Excel. And by mean the world, I mean the world. Finance, you know, HR, everything runs on Excel. Microsoft's really happy about that. Um, and you know, despite all the failures they have in other market, they can already rely on office licensing. But I think as a world, we should be pretty sad about that. It's, it's hard to debug. Uh, it requires a desktop program. It programs in a way that's very hard to know. You're missing a parenthesis. There's been errors that cause massive shifts in, in profit statement recounting. That's not really, as engineers, the best way to run the world, right? So what if we take what is good about Excel? Instead of using the cell inside sheets data model, we use JSON, JSON everywhere. That's the theme of this, talk, uh, of this conference. Instead of using this functional language, you use JavaScript or something else, or something that allows you to express semantics against a tree, and it's not just as against grids. Instead of calculating things only when you open the file, you have this op calculating all in the background, in the cloud. Wouldn't that be great? And instead of just using whatever supported chart types that Microsoft decided to give you in the chat gallery so that you can you know, pick your color, you can use anything drawable in HTML5, or if you deliver your JSON into iOS, anything that you can do in core animation or, or, or on, on the respective native platform. So there was a missing grid there. What is that app? So it doesn't exist today. But today I'm going to introduce something we've been working on within the labs in collaboration with Zinniki Network, which work with us uh, on new technology and trying to turn our ideas, crazy ideas sometimes, into reality. And the idea and the product and the open source project, which I'll give you a link to download, is called Zigrid. And Zigrid is basically like Excel, is a functional reactive, reactive programming language, it's FLP. The first thing it does is instead of cells, it stores document, JSON documents in Couchbase. That's your value. It could be nested, can be not nested, doesn't really matter. And then you specify your function in JSON. Well, now, it's, you can specify in any encoding you want, but we just happen to put it in JSON so we can put your model in the Couchbase as well. That's, there's a lot of benefits to that. We'll talk about it in a second. Then we build dependency graphs to say, oh, the sum of this document, which is your income statement, depends on these other documents. And then we essentially activate a dependency graph network and monitor changes using Couchbase, the fact that the, mem uh, the in memory store has, tells you what ch has changed, and I think future innovation will make that even better. We just listen to things for what you have changed in the database. Whatever UI you use, we look at Couchbase and say, oh, someone update that or added a document, we know that changed, and we propagate that all the way up. And we call that a ziggurat. It's a three-dimensional kind of trellis, going, you know, triangularly going from the bottom up. The great thing is that everything that we generate are basically, like Excel, just a document. So every aggregate that we're keeping up to date can just be accessed using the existing protocol that you are using to power your application. So the layer of the ziggurat is very simple. You have the raw events coming in. Based on some transformation, we create enhanced events, and then we summarize them and reduce them, and then we rank them. We'll talk about that in a second, about how that can be done using incremental rep reduce, which we did. And then we create correlation, comparing two things, on aggregates, which is kind of machine learning kind of stuff. We create snapshots, so we can go back to history Q1, Q2 versus Q3. And then we create composite, which is essentially a dashboard or JSON structure that allows you to just display that in a composite object. So that's what a ziggurat is. So we did something with educational data that we thought about presenting. as like, well, that's too much privacy concern, and anomalous data don't really quite work. So we backed up and said, well, let's not show what we're actually working on because I have to kill you. But let's pick another use case that will help us really, really get there. So help me introduce uh, Gareth Powell, who is going to be presenting the demo, the live demo of what we have built in the last two weeks. Uh, for this conference, it's built for this conference and will open source all the code. 
He's a functional programming expert. He did his PhD in University of Bristol, wrote a paper on Haskell, one of the research languages for functional programming. And um, he's a baseball fanatic. So it, lo and behold, I guess, he said to me, let's analyze baseball data. Gera? Thank you. Um, the other thing that I am, apart from being a baseball fanatic, is uh, I'm a mathematician, so I think that most baseball statistics are rubbish. So I wanted to have a go at trying to uh, generate real statistics and things that actually mean something to people. So if we can cue the demo up. So this is what we did. Um, you can dim the light. This is our um, first screen. What we did was to download some historical data from 2007 to 2012 and CSV files. You can find it on the internet. It's public data. Play? Yep, go ahead. Um, and we sliced that up line by line. We took each at bat one by one. And we pumped all those events together with game results and the like into Couchbase. That's about 1.5 million records. Those will go in front of your eyes in the next seven minutes if everything works properly. Um, so the first thing that happens is you get all these events coming into Couchbase that are basically just representations, JSON representations of lines in a CSV file. That does not work very well. <laughs> it's a bit like this demo right now. You want me to refresh? We'll give it a minute. Um, That's always kind of scary when yeah. you're doing a live demo. It was, Don't it worry, was... I have a backup video. <laughs> OK. There we go. That's yeah, live. So the first thing that we have to do is to enhance the inputs that we're getting. So we get something that says, this person hit a single. So we want to map that into a different JSON document that says that the number of singles that this person hit with this at bat is one. So then we can start summing these things. So on the left-hand side here, we have fairly standard standings tables. Uh, they're not actually sorted, but don't worry about that detail. But what's happening is we're looking at each game result. We enhance that to say who won, who lost. And we count the number of wins and losses. And then we sum those up. It still doesn't seem to be moving. We try again. Refresh. Yeah. Um, this is connected to our Amazon EC2 cloud, which for those of you who are DevOps people um, will be aware that uh, Amazon East Coast went out this morning. Um, and we're connected via WebSockets. We are adding up uh, the wins and losses as they come in, one and zero, in these left-hand columns. And you should see those come in uh, in a moment or two. You can see down here the uh, date that we're moving through. So this is, as I said, uh, recorded data, historical data. And you'll see that the games are coming through 15 games a day. And you can see the date moving forward. As it comes through, we're summing the totals. Those are documents in Couchbase, um, but they're being calculated on the fly. Um, we're not just recording information about games. We're recording information about individual players and doing exactly the same thing. So we're summarizing the number of home runs that's hit by any given individual. And then in, in um, Couchbase, we are using a uh, view to sort those. So the sorting that isn't happening here is happening with these tables. And there's, I don't know, 2,000 or so major league players. And they are all being sorted by home runs, as you can see on the fly. Apologies, it's not truly, truly live. But this was honestly recorded live. Um, we can do more than just adding up. Uh, at the top, we have the batting average numbers. Those are being added up and then averaged. So we're taking a count of the number of hits that people have got, taking a count of the number of at-bats they've had, and dividing one by the other. So I said uh, a few moments ago that in addition to being a baseball nut, I'm a uh, somewhat statistical nut. The middle figure here is my replacement for RBI. RBI is a count that doesn't really help you that much. What I wanted to say was, how many RBI should somebody get? So we uh, look at the number of RBI they did get, and we average that against the number of opportunities they had. If you have runners on third base, you should get more RBIs than if the bases are empty when you come up. So this gives us an average number that we can look at, which is very much more reflective of what the opportunity somebody had than, um, than just a straight number. Um, on the right-hand side here, we have uh, a player profile. So I was, uh, Chris was saying that we can composite things. This is a composite of five different things that we're getting from um, JSON documents. The first thing is that when we are looking at all the at-bats, we record a player's 
ID and what their username is. And then from um, the same summaries that we're using, the same rolled up summaries, we're introducing the number of at-bats they get, the number of hits they get. And finally, we're doing some more advanced calculations we'll get to in a minute um, that show the, uh, show, show the other values that we keep about them. Um, as you can see, we're now into 2009, so we have a filter up there that is able to select the seasons. Um, as you reach the end of one season, the data goes stale, obviously, because we've played all 162 games for that season. So the remaining question is, I, I've said that we can enhance data, we can summarize data, we can sort it using views, we can compose data, but can we do any more exciting things like statistical analysis? So things that you normally think of as being, quote, machine learning are things like correlations and decay. So this is a uh, graph, uh, as Chris was saying, we are not using Excel charts. This is done using D3 in, uh, H in HTML5. Uh, and JavaScript to display uh, a mapping of two values, the hotness and goodness that we saw before. Um, and again, in real time, as these games play through, those values are calculated and the players move around the screen. So you may ask yourself, what are hotness and goodness? They're, again, statistics that I made up myself. I apologize, but because of the rush to um, get the demo done, these two axes are inverted, so in fact, Hotness is marked as going upwards, but it goes crossways. Don't worry about that. Um, the idea here is that goodness is a correlation. So what you're seeing is that um, every player who comes up to do an at-bat is in a particular situation. There's a certain inning, certain score, certain number of uh, runners on base. What he does in that situation will affect the outcome of the game. We can look at the historical data and say, what was the actual outcome of the game? And we can draw a correlation that says, in this situation, doing this thing is generally highly correlated or generally lowly correlated with winning. We can then go back and look at the number of times each individual player, to pick one, which normally I would point to one, but unfortunately we have to go <laughs> off whatever is recorded. But if you take Ken Griffey, for example, you could look at him and say, what does he, uh, how often does he find himself in a particular situation and does he do this thing? You then cross multiply against the correlation, add those things up average them, and for each individual player, you come up with a statistic which is between zero and one, and says this is how good this person is. To take it away from baseball, you can look at things like this individual in a class took this course or looked at this course material. How, what grade did they get afterwards? Is this a good, effective piece of course material or not? In the other direction, we've got hotness, which as I say, is actually going that way. Um, and what that's telling you is if you, if you want to know what have you done for me lately, you don't want to look at, you know, did this person when I signed them in 2007 do a good job? You want to know, did they do a good, good job in the last 20 days or so? So one of the things that we were doing specifically here is to look at the players who are in all-star classes, and if you play with this yourself, you can look at the individual all-star classes and see, were they good every year or were they just good in the year they got picked for the all-star class? Um, and by looking at the hotness, you can say, I want to see the number of uh, the, their batting average and their production values averaged over the last 20 games or so. So what we're doing there is to calculate on a day-by-day -day basis what those values are, and then uh, summarizing them and using a linear decay over 20 games to reduce that to a single number. Right. There's actually data on the other side that I forgot to change because I was too worried that this actually won't work. But as we were on the video, this actually processed all of it. So like, when, remember when we were here, uh, we, we didn't see any numbers, but eventually the Wi-Fi let, let, let us in and let the, all the data come out. So I would have loved to have shown you as this was happening. I was like, should I switch now? Am I tempting fate? Uh, but you can see, like, this actually is real data, so I can switch back to another year and see the standings as of that. Um, unfortunately, to restart this, I have to run a shell script, uh, but, you know, so I can't really do that for you. Can but I what... just say that when, when you do that, as you flick back there, it's almost instantaneous as you change the years, that um, that is loading the relevant documents which have been stored in Couchbase, yes. and because they're, they're there, we're not doing any calculations to do this. That is just literally the amount of time that it takes to go over the wire 
and recover the 40 different values that we need and, and sort all those things and get them to all filter through to the display. Great. So, let's, uh, if I can figure out where my thing flew back in, let's continue. So, the architecture is relatively simple. Uh, we use Couchbase on the bottom to store the raw data as we push the CSV file data in, and all the aggregate data that you see are being done that way. We do use incremental rep, rep reduce uh, on things where we need to sort things. So we, if we want to make a leaderboard and we want to sort them in a you know, rever reverse order, we use Couchbase view for that. Uh, some calculation that are plus equals or plus plus, we just count them similar to how Twitter Storm do does it in memory outside in Java. And we have a Java engine which is communicating through the memcache protocol. And then uh, what's really cool about this is that we are basically using WebSockets uh, from Java to push all the new Delta events and set up the subscription. Garrett, you wanna, uh, Garrett do you want to add to this? No, fine. Okay. So this is called Bean Counter in, uh, because Billy Bean, Oakland A's. Um, so hopefully when, when the math and everything works out well, this would be a good way to monitor player in real time without having to wait until the end of the season. So quickly, I'm going to jump through this. Uh, the actual model is you go to define it. It's kind of like the Excel formula. It's actually all done in JSON. So the data model itself, all the fields, yes, it's the S word. It's a schema. Uh, it allows us to understand the data types and how to aggregate them. Um, the calculations are essentially done in a way that it can be associative and commutative. So we have to kind of do the math to figure out exactly how to do that so we don't have to go back and add it from the first row and the first item on. We can incrementally add to that. And finally, the actual projection, the composite that you get, like the pair profile, is also defined uh, in this Zigwit language. Now, it, this is not necessarily how the language is to be, but by doing it in JSON, you can always generate it. So you can have UI on it, you can create a JavaScript generator, you can do CoffeeScript type of stuff, and just generate this model after that. So there's a lot of flexibility of what the UI, whether it's for developer or for end users. Zikrit is 100% open source. Why? Because I want you guys to help me with this. Because this is a good idea. I think this is maybe even a great idea. But we need to work together, not only with Couchbase, but figure out what algorithm makes sense, what, how to make this easier to use. So uh, this link, github.com, Zikrit, Zikrit, I will hopefully someone will tweet it out later on. Uh, we have actually put together um, a little description of basically more awful level detail about the Zikrit operation, sorting, snapshot, decay, machine learning, all this stuff is there. And all the code that is sh shown and the build script to actually run it on your local host machine uh, is also made available there. So we want you guys to help us make this better. So what does better mean? Um, I think there are really four dimensions that we can make this better. One is that we can have greater scalability by any good BI engine that pushes the processing down to the database, to the, to the UA database have the ability to support that, we don't have to deal with it in kind of middleware land. We can let the beta database do what it does well. So any improvement and future improvement to the view engine or even the query engine, we'll just say, oh, that's great. For this operation, just push it down to the database. It allows us more flexibility and greater speed. The second one is that we are right now waiting for views like the leaderboard to commit to this. Uh, and we don't know when the views are committed to this, so we're actually waiting 10 seconds. So if um, Couchbase add feature like the upper protocol, a uniform, unified protocol for replication, we can treat Zigrid as a listener for all the events that's going on within the database and say, aha, this leaderboard has an up to date, let me just notify the client or other future steps in there. So that would reduce the latency from the data. Now the latency about 15 seconds. It was a little bit longer before I switched over the video, but if it was a little bit faster, I would say, hey, data is coming in. It's about 15 to 30 seconds, depends on your network connection, all the way from the input to the output. Uh, deep analytics, these functions can be in, in, uh, enhanced. We can create more powerful function, like sums, and uh, you start with that and then like, you know, MPV, uh, PVT, whatever function that you use, uh, those, are, those can be built into Zigrid. And finally, this is where I'm really excited. Uh, Excel is powerful because it's a UI that people learn. So there's a way for business people or regular mere models, not necessarily developers, to develop their own models within a GUI application given that you know, we can push the envelope on JavaScript and all these kind of things. It would be nice to be able to see that. Plus, the Zigrid engine can also generate JavaScript executable so you can work on a subset of data within your browser and not have necessarily need to have a database engine behind that. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. 
Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop is great. It's the king of big data, no doubt about in my mind. A lot of things would not happen, a lot of things that users of Couchbase is using that. But Hadoop is ETL. It's taking one step of the process, processing it across a giant cluster, putting it back in, doing the next step. You have all the problem of refreshing. And I think there are applications where Hadoop is perfect for it. But for supporting application where user requires and expects real-time experience, may not be the right tool. Twitter Storm is also great, and we can certainly use that as a way to uh, layer the Zigbee language in front of it and use Twitter Storm to do the processing. But we think about mascot here. So if elephant, big and powerful, but possibly sluggish and slow at times, is Hadoop, and I think it's a pretty good analogy of what they do. What is Zigrid? We have heard of zebras. Wait for sound. Everybody react to it and just run really, really fast in one direction as a herd. That's what the Z, Zigrid, Z for zebra, plural, right? And I think. Having these kind of choices, and especially when building on top of a database like Couchbase that already have a lot of these underpinning foundations in them, I think we can really open a new chapter in analytics and be able to say real-time analytics that does not have compromises, that can do everything that you want to do. The Billy Bean, the master of sabermetrics in, in, in production can be proud. So that's it, that's the end. And this was done heroically by Gareth on the back end. And Eric Diamond, who has worked with it on the DevOps stuff, I would not blame him for the outage this morning and our latency today. Uh, but Stefan Panner and Alex Mashnia, they're two members of the EmberJS core team. Uh, they worked with us in building this amazing, sexy front end on top of Ember, D3, and WebSockets. So they, they really took some time out of their busy lives on open source and the day work to help us put this demo together. And that's it. So any questions for us or uh, for, for me or for Gareth? Uh, on the model, the demo, and directions. No questions? I don't do basic fantasy baseball, no. It, it really is, um, you know, as, as a baseball fan, I think I know more than most of the commentators do that they come out and they say ridiculous things like this guy should hit more and it's like but he's you know over his last 18 why, why do you think he should bat and, and I particularly wanted to go and look at real correlations and say what what actually is the truth you know can we find some hard numbers that, that reflect you know that you say well okay this guy has 65 RBI but he keeps on coming up behind some good hitters so what any other question comment Um, I don't know if I should. Um, we have to flip the hotness and goodness thing. I think that would be a tremendously bad uh, mistake in your own data set to bet against that. So there, there needs to be more to be done for, for me to put my own money behind the analytics here. Any other questions, comments? All righty. Secret.